Good morning, everyone. My name is Francis, and I'm here to welcome you to First United Methodist Church right here in Fairbanks, Alaska. We're so happy you found us, and we hope that you enjoy this hour as much as we enjoy bringing it to you, and we hope you come back and join us again. Welcome. Please join us in singing What a Friend. So much. 
does peace even look like anymore? It feels so foreign, so often completely absent from the world we live in. He is our peace. Jesus, our Savior, is our peace. He is the one who brings calm and quiet and rest. Give us tangible moments of deep peace. Help us to believe that it is possible to experience peace even in the midst of chaos. And make us instruments of your peace. May we always spread the truth of Christ and the peace that he brought to each person that we meet. Thank you, God, that peace is not lost. Just help us to know how to see it. Amen. Listen now for a word from the Lord as I read from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
In the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until it sees on something There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery. we're used to having unfettered access to many areas of the world that not everyone has access to. Of course, sometimes you need to go get a, a visa along with your passport, which is basically permission to enter another country. And some may consider the amount that we spend putting up our own borders and fences and walls to be a bit exuberant. But Paul reminds us that as followers of Jesus... We are the aliens, and in Paul's time, unwelcomed aliens, though we might prefer the term resident aliens, resident aliens, uh, giving a nod to the classic work of Harwas and Willimon that argued that Christians need to see themselves as living in a foreign land in which they're called to live out in a radical way an anti-worldly discipleship following Jesus and the kingdom of God. In Paul's time, Gentiles, as far as Jews were concerned, those that followed Jesus, whether they have been Jews that followed Jesus or non-Jews that followed Jesus, were considered to be aliens and strangers, people without a country, without a hope, without a God, as far as they were concerned. But now, Paul, Paul says, those who were once far off have received a new identity along with God's covenant people, an identity stamped now with the blood of Christ. But there was division even in the church in Paul's time. When Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he recognized that a similar crisis was occurring within the church. Some congregations then, as in even now, required people to be of a certain ethnic, a political, linguistic, or theological view to, to enter or gain full acceptance. But here is where Paul intervenes as a Jew and as a former Pharisee and as an apostle to the Gentiles, whose culture he also knew very well, Paul understood the dilemma, but also he knew the solution. He proposed that the old citizenship that had separated Jews and Greeks was now invalid. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, he wrote to the Galatians, as citizens, citizens of a new sovereign realm, they are freely given a new identity, a new community of faith. And it is interchangeable. When they visit a church in Rome, they'll let you in. When they visit a church in Corinth, they'll let you in. Visit a church in Thessalonica, 
they'll let you in. Your old citizenships, your, your connections to your previous life have been replaced by this new common citizenship where the only qualification is faith in Christ and the only visa needed is the mark of Christ's blood shed on the cross. Paul points out advantages to these, this new citizenship that transcends boundaries and borders. Paul reminds the Ephesians that Christ in his flesh made both Jews and Gentiles into one group and has now broken down that dividing wall that was the hostility between them. Paul may be referring to his own house arrest in Rome, a sojourn that allowed him some time to write the believers at Ephesus. He'd been accused of bringing a Gentile into a part of the temple in Jerusalem that was forbidden. And taking a non-Jew beyond a particular dividing wall was such a heinous breach of Jewish law, the Romans even allowed temple authorities to execute people who violated this rule. Paul was spared because of his Roman citizenship and was given the right of appeal. Awaiting the outcome of appeal, he's held by the authorities in Rome and takes up writing these letters. The readers who first cracked open the scroll would have known what he was talking about and why he was in prison. For them, the barrier between Jew and Gentile was best symbolized by that dividing wall of the temple. But Paul announces that this dividing wall has been shattered in Christ, who takes the place of the temple and enables all to come and gather in him. There's plenty of dividing walls both inside and outside the church, just as there were in Ephesus. Today's divisions of race and politics and parties, practices, doctrines can cause Christians to look, look at others as second-class citizens instead of under the sovereign realm of God. Recently, many churches have begun to look at, look at barriers they may have inadvertently set up to create a hindrance to people, a stumbling block. One of the things they look at is when folks enter a church, what are, they, what are they greeted with? Many times images of the divine, many times images of Jesus. How do we like the divine represented on our walls? Walk into a church and if you're met by a portrait of a, a fair-skinned, blue-eyed, moderately long-haired Jesus, I bet most of the people in that church are fair-skinned, blue-eyed, and well, maybe not long-haired, but you get, the, you get the idea. One of the things that has people all upset these days is talk of critical race theory. Well, one of the first premises of critical race theory is that race that divides us, the issues that divide us, many times are social constructs to begin with. Therefore, they can be deconstructed, just as a wall can be knocked down. Paul says that faith in Christ transcends these outer artificial boundaries. Like him, we must be bold enough to cross those boundaries, even if it costs us something. If we are in Christ, the only passport, most powerful one we need, is the one that we're given by God through Jesus Christ, that citizenship in God's sovereignty. That citizenship in the sovereign realm of God brings with it a new set of rules. Paul wrote that Christ has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus bringing us together. The law to which Paul is referring to is the law of Moses and its practices that separated Jews and Gentiles. Paul saw this law as already now fulfilled in Christ. The death and resurrection of Jesus made peace between God and humanity and between Jew and Gentile. Citizenship in the reign of God, therefore, is marked by faith and obedience to Christ. Not by what we eat or what we wear or how we even worship, but by in that faith in and obedience to Christ. The citizen of the sovereign realm of God has the direct access. That sovereign 
through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That is the power. The Old Covenant was mediated by the priests in the temple offering sacrifices on behalf of the people for the forgiveness of sins. But Paul says now, through Jesus, we have access in one spirit to the Father. Instead of the custom of a gatekeeper who chooses to allow people or not allow people into a country, Jesus calls us to welcome, to be the, like the welcoming host, to bring people directly to God. Think of it. We're called to be the welcoming host to the kingdom of God, not the bouncer at Club Heaven. We've been given that spirit that intercedes for us in ways that are beyond our understanding. Paul reminds us also that the citizenship is forever. It's freely offered, and there's nothing we need to do to qualify except to receive. Finally, it allows access to all. Now, people who have traveled abroad a lot will tell you, having a U.S. passport gets you in many more places then it doesn't. Therefore, you're free to go any place. In the commonwealth of God, we are free to roam at will. We're free to go and to serve, to go into areas of poverty and to give food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothing to the naked, shelter to the homeless, medical aid to the sick. We're free to build schools and hospitals and places of shelter and worship and clinics. We're welcomed in communities of faith. We're free to speak, speak to power, to march in protests, to worship in peace, to proclaim the coming of the sovereign realm of God, increasing through us or in spite of us. Free to welcome all, and no one can set definitions of what all includes. No restrictions. Our citizenship in the realm of God will never expire. But how, perhaps it does need to be renewed and refreshed within us from time to time. In a world where divisions seem to grow deeper every day, it's time for the church to renew our citizenship in the sovereign realm of God. We've been given in Christ. It's time to be bold, to break down the walls that have been built up, those social constructs like race and ethnicity and political party, so that in the church we demonstrate to the world, we demonstrate to the world what true citizens of the divine commonwealth, what, how we live and what it would look like. Be willing to go and share this life together with others, with others who other who governments or pundits or politicians might see as aliens and strangers, but whom the people of God see as brothers and sisters and fellow citizens of another world, a world to come, a world that is dawning through those living in and living out the values of the kingdom of God. We hope that you've been enjoying our online services, our drive-in services, our outdoor services, our indoor in-person services. We, we thank you for your generous support of our ministries here just below the Arctic Circle where we're still involved in, in feeding and housing the needy as well as being a voice of justice and mercy. We appreciate your gifts, your time, your treasure, your talent. You can contact the office Monday through Thursdays, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at 907-452-2956. You can send contributions to FUMC at 915 2nd Avenue, Fairbanks, Alaska, 99701. Let us, pray, let us pray. All things come from you. Remind us that with every decision we make, every gift we give, or hold on to for our own use. Let us be good stewards of your bounty. Make us cheerful givers with the bounty you have entrusted to us, the bounty of our time, our energy, our abilities, and our treasure. In response to that all we have been given, we offer these gifts to you, O God. This we do in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.
please join us in singing Trust in You. Please join us in singing Living Hope.
at First United Methodist Church here in Fairbanks, Alaska, just below the Arctic Circle. It is Sunday, the 18th of July, the 8th Sunday after Pentecost. We are still offering for the month of July indoor services at 9 a.m. and an outdoor service at 10 a.m. And we hope that when you think of the places and the people that need healing and need peace, that you might consider yourself the one that's called to be that healing in peace in the midst of this world. So let us come together in prayer. O Lord, as we come here and now, fill us with that deep sense of your presence and that strong sense of your empowering spirit to take this time to renew our faith and replenish our hearts. Rebirth our spirit so that we may live with hope and confidence. This and every day, serving in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, may you go forth, go forth this week into the greatness of the name Jesus Christ living under Christ's sovereign realm. And let all that is within us praise the Lord with our lives. In the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that Spirit goes with us as we live forth. Amen. Amen.